and welcome again to Evangelism Lesson 2. Uh, tonight we're going to uh, start to get into kind of the meat of our topic, and uh, we're going to look at the transition we go through as believers from receiving to proclaiming the gospel. That's the theme of tonight. And, and really, uh, as we uh, spent the last week really thinking about and exploring motivation for what, what it is we're sharing and why we're sharing it, um, that motivation really should come to the heart of this uh, transition that we go through uh, from receiving the gospel, going from one side of the equation to the other. And so I think it's really important for us to go back to that moment of our transformation and our transition. And I think it's really important for us to carry that forward as we go forward because it's really difficult for us to really connect to somebody who's where we were uh, unless we remember we were there too. And I think it's too often in our uh, Christian community that we forget and we quickly separate and uh, we become at that point then pretty judgmental, right? And that connection gets lost. And you'll see, uh, tonight, you'll see uh, that our role and our purpose in receiving the gospel is not just salvation for ourselves, but sharing it for others. All right? So tonight is about uh, receiving and proclaiming. Last week, we talked about who an evangelist is, and it's everybody. It's all of us. We're either called or commissioned. We're all commissioned. Some of us are called specifically either to go out into the world um, or to train others to go out into the world, but we're all called to share, or we're all commissioned to share the gospel. All right, so I don't have a question for you tonight, so I actually have to do some teaching, uh, but not a lot of teaching. I'm literally going to be working this, con this conversation out with you real time. It's something that I've been working on for the last maybe two or three days, and I'm not sure I've got it clear yet, so I'm going to wa walk through it with you. Um, but I, I wanted to share something that I noticed starting on the salvation side. So if we go to Romans 10, uh, verses 5 through 10, we see that uh, Paul's writing about Moses, and he says, and in general, this chapter is about Israel, or this section in Romans is about Israel, and he's dealing with the idea of the fairness in how God has dealt with Israel, and then how the Gentiles are grafted in. It's kind of the section of the letter that we're in. And so, and this is really the, the, one of the verses that we rely on when we look at salvation. Uh, we look at Romans 10, 9, uh, but in this section, I wanted to give it some context. So it says, for, for Paul writes, for Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now I'm going to get into the second part of this verse in a second. But the first part of this verse, Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 30, I think it's verse 12. And in that section, Moses is repeating the law, or he's going over the, the commitment that, uh, and the covenant that's been made between Israel and God. And he's really saying to them, uh, don't say you don't know. Don't say you don't understand what's been given to you. Don't say you have to go over here or over there. That's what the kind of the last uh, set of instructions that Moses is going through with Israel before they head into the promised land and he dies. Right Before he dies and they head into the promised land. That would be the right order. Um, and so he's saying, don't say you don't know. And then the next verse in Deuteronomy, the next section, is for this day I put before you the choice of life and death. Choose life. So he's saying, you know, it's already been testified of you, and choose life. Don't say you don't know. It was interesting to listen a little bit on the conversation about uh, the judges and the taking of the promised land in Old Testament Survey 2 and in your last lesson where the question comes up, 
well, did they hear? Did those have the those who were in the land that God said to go wipe out, did they know, right? And did they have a fair chance? And that's how we're always going to think about this. Wait, wait, before you judge me, stop. Tell me the gospel thing again, right? Give me one more chance so I have a, we look at it from a fairness standpoint. And Moses is actually saying, wrong. You've got that order wrong. You already know. In fact, for those that have been going through the wilderness, if you think about it, they start that journey in front of a mountain with a voice from the mountain coming down, telling them. And their reaction is, whoa, (laughs) we don't want to hear that. You talk to Moses, he'll talk to us, that's good enough for us, right? And so from that point forward, what happens? They don't remember the voice from the mountain. They forget the voice, and they continue in rebellion. And really, that's where we are. Every person on that side of salvation, on the side that's separated from God, knows and is in rebellion. Paul says this in Romans 2. So so that you're without excuse, he says. Right? The invisible attributes and the power of God are seen and known so that you're without excuse. And so we have to remember that on this side of salvation. It's not a fairness issue about sharing the gospel so that they have a chance to hear, so that they can be saved because they didn't hear, therefore it's not fair if they die in that state. That's not the condition that's being raised here. All right? So that, so, and, and just as evangelists, I, I think this is really important. Again, I'm working this out with you, kind of real time. I think this is really important for us to understand. It's not that our job is that we have to go reach everybody because they deserve to hear the good news. They're in a condition, we were in a condition of utter rebellion to God. That means we knew who God was whether we wanted to acknowledge that or not, and we chose to reject God. That is the state of the world across universally, every condition of every human being. That's why grace is so important. Because what comes next is really amazing, what God lays out. Let's start to look at what's next. So in that condition where we don't deserve to hear it again, we don't deserve another chance again, look what he says in verse 8, what Paul says in verse 8. But what does it say? He's reminding you of what's said in Deuteronomy. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. He's reminding, by the way, that this has been the way it's always been. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the, with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So what does that mean when we say we've confessed with our mouth and believe in our heart? And frankly, for me, I've always mostly focused on the idea of the belief in the heart. It's been actually a, an area of study for me for a long period of time. What does it mean to actually believe? And we've talked a little bit about this in soteriology and Systematic theology, the idea of belief being a sense of trust, placing your trust in somebody or some thing, and we're, here we're surrendering ourselves and putting our trust in God, and then how do I trust something that's not seen? I don't see God. And so how do I get to the point of that moment of trust? But what I noticed in the last week is the idea of the confession. I missed, to me, the confession and how important it is. Okay, so what does it mean to confess? Why confess? Why is it important to confess something when uh, God knows everything? He knows in my heart if I've surrendered in my heart. Why must I confess that? And look at the condition in verse 9. It's both. If you believe, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, it's a specific confession. It's not just confess anything. God, I know you're real. That's not good enough. It says, by the way, later on in Scripture, it says even the demons know that. That's not good enough. 
This confession is specific. It's Jesus is Lord. That's the confession. And, be and believe in your heart. Those are the two conditions that meet, that have to be met for salvation. Okay, so why? Why, why on the confession side? So here's our word. So we're just going to dive into, like we did last week, and look at the words. What is, what is Paul trying to tell us here? What is God speaking to us? This is a homologio. That's the word for confess. So interesting thing about this is it means to profess. And when we looked last week at evangelism, there's a lot of professing going on. The moment of salvation begins the moment of evangelism. The moment you're confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, you are an evangelist. <laughs> You are confessing him as part of receiving him, but you're also proclaiming him. Do you see that? That's amazing to me. Here's why. We're all in a state where we don't deserve to hear this. We're all in a state where we don't deserve the opportunity to choose this. We're all in that state. And God says, not only am I going to offer you, my son, I'm going to offer to use you to proclaim my son to others. And it's going to start from the moment you confess, whatever that means. You're going to not just receive him, but you're going to start to be used by me to proclaim him. That's fantastic, right? If you think in your life that God has never used you, the moment you proclaimed Jesus Christ as Lord, if you did what Paul told you to do, which was confess it with your mouth. Notice, by the way, it was specific again. Don't just confess it silently to myself. Confess it with my mouth, meaning I have to say that publicly I've become an evangelist. God has already used you from the moment you've entered into his kingdom. What a fantastic moment that is, and what a fantastic assignment that is for us to enter into the kingdom, is that we're being used from the moment that he, he allows us in uh, by that. So what does it mean to confess? Well, this to me is also important. Homologio is also not just to confess, but there's a, an act of of admission and acknowledgement and allegiance. Admission, acknowledgement, and allegiance. When I'm confessing Christ as Lord, I'm admitting that I understood him. I, I may not have acknowledged him in the past as Lord. My confession is an admission that this day forward, I admit that that state is true in my life now. I am also acknowledging that. Where I have avoided that in the past, I'm acknowledging that. Why is this important for us as evangelists? Because this is where we're leading others to. <laughs> right? Remember, we were on this side of salvation before. And we understood that really what the heart of the matter was is I refused to admit that Jesus Christ was Lord of my life. I refused to acknowledge that Jesus Christ was Lord of my life. I refused to be aligned or give my allegiance to him. That's me on the other side of salvation, in my sin state. Now when I make that confession, what I'm doing is I'm saying, you are Lord. I, Lord, I no longer refuse to admit that. Why? I'm admitting it publicly. I'm acknowledging it publicly. I'm confessing my allegiance publicly. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I had a Bible study Friday morning. And it was a first study, first group, get together. Love the guys that I'm with. First thing were introductions. You know that awkward moment when you have to introduce yourself to everybody? And the Bible study leader, a friend of mine, uh, a pastor, a newly ordained pastor, uh, said, uh, he was talking about identity. He said, forget about what you are, what you think you are. I want to talk about who I am. And he said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. 
And we instantly identified with that. I didn't know anybody in the room. Well, actually, I knew two guys in the room. I didn't know the other guys in the room. But instantly, as soon as we made that identification, that we are aligned, we are acknowledging, and we are admitting that we are followers of Jesus Christ, we were one in that group. We were one. We, us tonight, those who are listening uh, to, to the lecture, are one because we have made that allegiance and that admission and that confession that we are one with Jesus Christ, right? See how that act of that moment of salvation becomes critical? By the way, there's a trend, and then I'll move off of this in a second, but there's a trend uh, to not make this admission. I, I noticed in pastoring the church for several years that there is a difference in movements of altar calls, and, and it was a church that had a wide variety of denominations. And so... Uh, there were times where people said, oh, we don't do that. We, we, the altar call at the end, we don't do that part. So, and then there were guys who would give messages, and when they would make an altar call, in order to not offend those who were not used to making an, a public proclamation for Jesus Christ, would say, it's okay to just sit there silently in your chair and pray the prayer. And receive Christ into your heart. Now, that entirely may be true. Except there's a moment here in the last couple days as I'm looking at this, where my eyes are looking at it and going, Paul was very specific about what he said. He said to confess it. And we miss that part of confession sometimes. We don't have the opportunity. Not even given the opportunity by those that are calling us in the call to say, come, the Holy Spirit's calling you and prompting you. Answer the call. Get up. Make the proclamation. Instead, we're saying, I know the Holy Spirit's calling you, but just stay silent and just skip to the second part. Believe in your heart, but don't confess with your mouth because you don't need to do that because I don't know why. <laughs> why? Are we really saying, is what we're really saying is that we're uncomfortable <laughs> with that proclamation so you don't have to be comfortable too? Somebody told me early on in my studies, that I had a habit of referring to God as God alone, and that he noticed, whether I was preaching or teaching, that very few times I would, I would invoke the name of Jesus. And he, sa and he said to me, first, I want to bring this up to you so that you're aware of it. Two, you need to go ask yourself, why? And, and in a quiet place, I would say, I wasn't confident in my proclamation. I wasn't comfortable in my proclamation. Maybe I wasn't sure of my proclamation. And so I had to get right with that. So if you ask me today, there's no issue of clarity. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. That is my primary identity. And it's because of this confession that I know that, right? It's the first step that we take in the identity. And it's the first step where we move from one side of salvation to the other, from the sin side to the save side. Right? And so now, as evangelists, we want others to join us. So how do we do that? Well, in evangelism, uh, uh, euangelizo, we looked at last week, was to announce the good news. And we said, what is good news? But at the heart of this, I want you to notice that Preach and proclaim, they're similar in terms, okay? So in proclamation for, for, um, for confessing, there's a similarity, and particularly there's a similarity in the idea of, of receiving and proclaiming, okay? So I, I just want to follow that through. And we see this cycle, and you see this in your, in your, in your text, Those slides were slightly behind my slides. So, okay, we're on slide six, which is the circle. And we see that there are unbelievers who need to hear the gospel. And then hearing the gospel turns them into believers. And the believers are sent out to preach the gospel. Um, you know, in the next section of Romans, in Romans 11, Paul says, well, how are they going to hear unless those are sent? And who's going to go? 
except those, blessed are the feet of those who go and proclaim the gospel, right? Notice, though, he ties them together in very short distances in Scripture as he's talking about the hearing, and he's saying in chapter 10, don't, go th don't think that the word is so far away that you haven't heard it, therefore you're excused. You're not excused. It's right there in front of you. He's quoting Deuteronomy. And then he says, when you hear it, here's what you need to do. You need to believe it, trust in it, and then confess it, proclaim it. Those are the two conditions. And then when you do that, the next thing he says in the next chapter is, how's anybody else going to hear it? You're going to go tell them. Fantastic, right? It's fantastic. All right, so uh, that's the tie-in in, in the transition. So now let's deal with the practical. Here's the practical. Why would God send me? I was stuck on this question for 10 years. Why would God send me? Maybe longer than 10 years. Right? Maybe he's gifted me to do other things. Maybe he's uh, made me to be a, a, a medical device engineer or to help people in other ways. But I would honestly look at pastors and preachers and say, never, couldn't be, won't happen. Tom, you and I have had this conversation multiple times, right? I think we're still having this conversation, but those walls are breaking down now. <laughs> and so uh, why would God use me? And we get stuck right there. And so the moment that we're confessing and we don't even realize that God is using us, we go, I'm not worthy. There's no way to be used. I, you know, I got this mess going on in my life. I don't want anybody to see that mess. I don't want to misrepresent God. We're all the way to the other side, which is, uh, you know, I really don't need to go help those people, <laughs> you know, whoever those people are. And maybe I'm feeling a little better than those people, but I don't quite connect with the idea that I was on that side of salvation, the sin side of salvation. And I easily forget that. If you want to parallel an Old Testament survey, those that have just gone through the wilderness experience, that have come out of slavery, the slavery of sin, those that have come out of slavery, who are now free, even though they're free in the wilderness, have forgotten what it was like to be in sin, in slavery. In fact, some of them say, it's better if we go back. We had better food. We had better care, we had better health care plan, right? It's better if we go back. That's the journey through the wilderness as they're headed towards the promised land, as they're headed towards the thing that God promised them. And actually the spies have seen, they went and saw the land. It's not like they had to imagine it. They saw where they're headed. They're on the salvation side of the equation, or they should be, because they've been delivered, and yet they want to go back. And for us, it's easy to be in that circumstance where we forget what it was like to be there. We forget the difficulty and the darkness that we've been brought out of. And we forget that others are living in that difficulty and that darkness. And we forget the transformation that God is bringing us through. Because this cycle doesn't happen on its own. God is now injecting himself into the equation. That's the key. Right? If he leaves it to us, well, the outcome is not going to be so great. But of course he doesn't. Because at that moment of confession, what happens? He joins us. He guides us. He gifts us. He gives us real power. In fact, now the third part of the issue of the confession and the proclamation is the word itself. John starts with the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word that spoke creation into existence. It's no accident that God chooses the spoken word as the, not only the moment of our salvation, but the moment of proclamation for evangelism, the way to salvation, right? And it's not our word. What I love about Paul is his honesty in his letters. He didn't come to you with flowery words or 
uh, appealing looks. I didn't come to you, you know, as the one that people would naturally follow. I came to you with the power of God's word, and that was more than enough. As evangelists, we're going to have to be really clear about that and completely reliant on that. That there's a transforming power that gets injected into this equation, and that if we are reliant on it, all things will work as they should. If we're reliant on ourselves, I better come up with a good message this week. A clever message. Um, all right, how about this? You know, with all kinds of theatrics that will get people's attention, by the way, that will capture and entertain them. It just won't transform them. It just won't impact them. Because the equation part in this circle that's missing is the power that, that exists to change. So I want to go to 2 Corinthians and, and end on this in 2 Corinthians because there are, there are uh, two sections of Scripture that I think ties this together and the two different sides of the salvation equation, the sin side and the salvation side, and what's really happening in, um, in a person's life as they're being transformed, and how that relates to evangelism. Okay, that's how I want to try to tie this together. We have a confession, and our confession that enters us into, into salvation also becomes the profession of our evangelism. That's where we're headed. And so how does that actually work? Paul kind of describes that. He says in verse 12, he says, Since we have such a hope, we're very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Um, Moses spent time in God's presence. He was transformed. He was physically transformed. He was glowing. <laughs> he was light, right? And so they put a veil over his face because that was disturbing as they looked at it. They're like, okay... Let's, you know, let's not, that's different, right? There was clearly a difference in Moses' appearance, his physical appearance. There was no question. When people looked at him, they said, something's happened to you, Moses, right? Something's different. That change that had occurred because he was in God's presence. But their minds, verse 14, were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. What's that veil? The veil is sin. The sin that causes separation is the thing that causes us to not look on the presence of God. And the only thing that can lift that veil, the only thing that can remove the sin in our lives is Christ. It gets better. Yet, uh, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. He's talking about Israel. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. All right, check this out. When I confess, when I make an admission, when I confess my allegiance, when I acknowledge who Christ is in my life, when I make that confession, the veil is lifted. Sin is removed. And I am becoming now an image of who Christ is. Okay? The veil is removed in my heart. Here's the thing. When we're speaking to those who have not made that confession, who have not placed their trust, their belief in Christ, when I'm speaking to somebody, that veil still exists. Right? The sin that separates them from God is still there. The veil is still there. When they look at you, they look at you like the Israelites looked at Moses. There's a veil. I don't get it. They're glowing. Why are they glowing? You can tell them all you want. You can testify of the change that Christ has made in your life all you want, but remember there's a veil there. There has to be a transforming moment 
And that can only come by the gospel. That can only come by the proclamation of who Jesus Christ is. It's not the miracles he did in your life. That's part of the testimony and important. It's not the things that you've seen God do in others' life. That's important, and you could tell him about that. But if you tell him about all of those things, and you do not tell them that the Son of God came into the world, walked a sinless life, died on a cross, so that man's sin and penalty would be paid for, my sin and your sin, so that we are no longer veiled or separated from God, if you do not tell him that, that veil is not going to be removed. That moment of separation is not going to be impacted. That good news must be proclaimed. The thing that causes you to get to that moment of admission and acknowledgement and acceptance of who Christ is, that's the chance that we want to give others. It's not the right that they have. We've given up that right, right? We're in the sin state. We're in rebellion. But the chance that God offers us is, here's what I've done for you. Do you want to accept it? That's the chance. And what he uses in our confession and our profession of who he is, is uses us as vessels to deliver that message. All of the work comes in the power of the gospel, not in how we present it. It's funny, though, to me that the most important thing that needs to be said is the one that we have the hardest thing saying. Maybe that's just me. (laughs) I can dance around this issue, tell you about all the good things that I've studied and all the good things that are going on in the church and all the good things that are happening in my life and Never get quite around to, by the way, did you know God came into the world? (laughs) Oh yeah, by the way, he died for you so that you can be with him and tell you all the things that are going on around and not tell you that central thing. And I have to really ask myself, and maybe you have to too, why is that? We come into salvation confessing that. Why is it that we're so hesitant to confess it and proclaim it on a continual basis? We should be shouting it from the mountaintops, literally, shouting it all the time, everywhere. Hi, how you doing? Jesus Christ is Lord. (laughs) Hi, how you doing? Are you having a good day? It's okay. Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know why we struggle with that, but it is the most important thing. It is the only thing that will cause this veil to lift. And it is the only thing that will move you from one side of the salvation equation to the other. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. We're not going to try to trick you into praying a prayer. A lot of people might be confused about whether or not they're Christians or not. Ask them. Who is Jesus Christ to you? If they can't get to he's Lord and Savior, just not there. Then explain it to them, because they may not have heard it. Because I think we struggle with the idea that we want to fit in rather than stand out. Moses had a veil over his face because he stood out. Right? Christ says the veil's lifted. It's time to shine. It's literally time to shine. Right, And so it says here, we refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but, to open, but by the open statement of the truth, by the open statement of the truth. That's all we got to do. We just got to tell the truth. We would commend ourselves to everyone's conscious, conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. There are some who when we speak that truth, they will not receive it. It is not a personal rejection of you. It is a personal rejection of Jesus Christ. He has sent you to tell them about him. 
And when we think we're rejected, the first thing I think, wait, Lord, I get it. They're, they're not just rejecting me. They're rejecting you, and I feel way worse for them and for the fact that the whole world that has been created by God, the Savior, is rejecting you. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Why is the veil there? The enemy is working real hard to keep darkness over their hearts, to keep them distracted and confused and delayed so that that truth will not lift the veil. What's our response? For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Just keep proclaiming the gospel. The enemy can work all he wants. It's not an equal fight. It's not God and the devil struggling to the end and we're not sure who's going to win. God created the fallen angels. He is the creator over all. And there is no question about the outcome. All we have to do is our job, our role. What's our motivation in this? If we're doing it for our credit, because we think we're the ones causing the veil to lift? Whoa. Stop. <laughs> Go spend some time in prayer with God and get clear about what is happening in this process. Go back to your moment where the veil was lifted in your heart and you saw the truth and you acknowledged that truth for what it was. And remember that you didn't deserve that chance. God gave it to you and he's giving it to others. Now go forward. Okay? So if our motivation is right and it's rooted and rested in the idea of gratitude, Lord, you, you would save me? <laughs> and, and I fail this often. I forget this often. And then God will have a fantastic way to just move me right back to, do you remember where we started? Do we need to go back there and start all over again? Because until I get it right, I can't be used to make the profession, to make the confession. I can't be used until I get it right. It's not an accident that we start the moment of salvation with the confession of Jesus Christ. It's not an accident that we start the moment of salvation being evangelists, and that we're meant to stay in that moment of acknowledgement and admission and, um, and acceptance of who Christ is. The minute we fall out of that state because sin has entered in our lives, what are we told to do? Confess. Confess our sins. Get them out of us so that we can get back to proclaiming and confessing Christ. It's just one constant, amazing circle that he's going to use in our lives. Paul closes with this. He says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He said previously in the third chapter, we are becoming like him. We are coming into his image in 2 Corinthians 3, right? And then he says here in the fourth chapter that he is the Christ is the express image of God. We are becoming like the image of God. We're not gods. Be clear but we are becoming like the image of God so that we're shining that into the world. How? We get confused about, we, th we think that it has to be about how I act and how I walk and how I talk. And those are all good things. And, you know, we should be careful about how our testimony and our witnesses and our actions and our deeds. But the primary point of the message here that Paul is telling us is confess 
who Christ is. Proclaim who Christ is. We can get so wrapped up in the details that we forget the central point. And the central point is the only point because it's the only one that will lift the veil, that will cause us to shine literally like Moses and make the message available to others. And it's an unending cycle. I'll close with this. It's, a, it's something that, that um, I'm still not clear about. But at any time that God wanted to save us, he could have done what he did with the Israelites on the mountain. He could just show up and speak to us. He could speak to every single one of us. At the moment where we're ready, he can show up and say, Paul, about time you got there. This is God. And now, are you ready to believe that Jesus Christ is my son? He can proclaim the gospel in a very literal, and I'm not kidding, a very literal vocal sense to every one of us. He could do that. Right? He's unlimited in power and he's everywhere and there's no reason to think that he couldn't individually speak to every person and say, this is your moment. I want you to be clear that this is the gospel message. I sent my son. He died for you so that you could be with me. He could do that at any moment. But he did. He sent you. And he sent me. Another act of grace. He could have done it. But he chose to use us instead. An infinite, outside of the creation God. He's bigger than what he created. And what he created is so big we can't wrap our head around it. He's bigger than that, right? And instead of staying outside of that creation, he stepped into the creation to save it. And then he took up residence in the creation to commune with it so that more would be saved. I don't understand that. I honestly don't. How a God that big would care that much about us that he would not just care that much about us to save us, but to use us and to be with us. To, to, he sent out, I don't know what the count is today because it's hard to get a count on how many real Christians there are in the world, but it's somewhere between one and two billion that are scurrying around the world, being used by God right now. It's a third of the planet that are scurrying around and tell the other two-thirds, hey, did you know that Jesus Christ is Lord? And maybe what we're not doing is being clear about what we're confessing. So next week, we're going to start to look at that. What is the message that we're supposed to be proclaiming? It's a lot simpler than we think. We make this job so much harder because we think it has to be us. Check our motivation. It's not about us. We don't get the credit. In heaven, they don't announce, now coming in, saved by. And then there's a profession. Because we have no saving power. Thankfully, I know I'd find a way to misuse that power. Right? The good news is God has all the saving power. He saved each one of us. And he intends to use that power through us. That's the amazing part. This week, watch how often you make that confession. Don't force it. Just watch how often. Also, this week, be aware of the places where you don't want to make that confession. Easiest ones, work. Can't mix work. Oh, fantastic lie of the devil. Three topics you can't talk about. Religion, politics, and taxes or death, whichever one you want to put in third, right? Fantastic lie of the devil. Why? I don't want anybody talking about that whole gospel thing, right? The other thing, can't talk religion at work. Fantastic lie of the devil. Why? I don't want anybody getting saved at work. 
Here's what I'll do. I'll make work get really big in people's lives. So there's a no gospel zone. Right? Work's going to burn. World's going to burn. I know the only thing that's going to be left is God. <laughs> so just watch where it is that you're uncomfortable with making the confession and where it is that you are comfortable. And then take that to God in prayer. Lord, why is it that I'm unwilling to confess you there? Why is it that I'm willing in this space, but not in that space? And then take this in prayer this week. Show me how, Lord. Show me how to be your witness and your testimony. Next week, we'll come back to uh, what it is we're supposed to be proclaiming. And then we'll actually get into and start to track how the master of the gospel, the, the essence of the gospel himself, Jesus Christ, did this. He modeled it for us. So we're going to start studying him. Then we're going to study Paul. And we're going to watch how Paul went and spread the gospel uh, around the world. He was a one-man uh, whirlwind. And that's what we'd like to be, is, is whirlwinds for God. Amen? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we so adore you and love you and, th and thank you. We're, uh, we remember, Lord, that we were in utter rebellion to you. Your existence, your rule and reign over our lives, Lord, we, um, we found new and different ways, Lord, to try to avoid it or reject it, Lord, and and yet, there was a moment in each one of our lives, Lord, where there was a, a time where we could no longer reject you, where there was a time where we had to uh, come to the acceptance, Lord, of who you are. You are God over all. Not just in truth, God over all, but you're God over all in our lives because we surrender our lives to you. We admit that, Lord. We confess you, Lord Jesus, as Savior and King, that you came into this world, Lord, to die for us. Lord, glory be to you, and honor be to you, and praise be to you. And Lord, show us the times in our lives, Lord, where the words form in our heads, Lord, where your spirit is moving our heart to speak them, yet we keep our mouth shut. Lord, show us those times. And Lord, show us the way to open our mouth so we could boldly proclaim, Lord, what it is you designed and created us to proclaim. Make that the mission of our lives, Lord. Empower us, Lord, so that we can share with others the opportunity that you gave in our lives and that we could joyfully rejoice with them or that more would come into your kingdom, that more would be in your presence, that the veil would be lifted over all, Lord, and that you would shine in, in all of your creation's lives, Lord. We pray that, Lord. We lift this week up to you, Lord. We lift this time up to you, Lord. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. We give you all glory and honor and praise, Lord Jesus, in your holy, true, and mighty name. Amen.